Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to CDE Virtual tonight. It's my very great privilege to welcome Larry Summers to, to the CDE conversation and to South Africa, at least virtually. Thank you for the time. Glad to be with you. Larry is one of the leading global economists of his generation. He has been Treasury Secretary under Bill Clinton, Director of the National Economic Council under Barack Obama, and he is President Emeritus of Harvard University. Larry, let's start with inflation. You're a member of the Democratic Party, and yet a month after President Biden took office in 2021, you criticized both the scale and the direction of the administration's fiscal policy. And you were absolutely correct, as we now sadly know. Why did you argue that the Biden administration's policies would set off inflationary pressures that America had not seen in a generation? First of all, and uh, let me say how glad I am to be uh, with you and with this uh, group. I have had a number of uh, opportunities to visit uh, South Africa, and I have always um, come away uh, wiser, and I have come away inspired by all that is happening in your country with all the many challenges, and I hope at some point uh, before too terribly long to have an opportunity to return, not virtually, uh, but uh, in person. Um, let me turn to your question and just say, to start with, I, I am, as you said, a Democrat. I'm a strong supporter of uh, President uh, Biden, as I was honored to work for President uh, Clinton and for Vice President Biden, along with uh, President uh, Obama. And I am particularly a strong supporter in light of what can only be called some of the depravities that we have seen on the opposition Republican uh, side uh, in uh, the United States. But I'm an economist, and as far as judging the consequences of economic policies for economic variables, my obligation is to call them as I see them, uh, not to try to skew my analysis in favor of one particular uh, political perspective. And so I try to call them as I see them, regardless of who is uh, in power, because I think ultimately, who's ever in power is going to be best served by there being the most accurate and rational economic debate uh, in our country. What I saw last winter was a, uh, or in the winter, in the winter of 2021, was a dynamic in which we in the United States had um, a GDP gap. We were perhaps 2%, perhaps 3 or 4% short of our potential. And what was under discussion was um, a policy of providing 14% of GDP in fiscal stimulus, while at the same time holding interest rates at zero, rapidly expanding the Fed's balance sheet, and working off an overhang of savings accumulated during the time of COVID when people couldn't uh, spend their money in restaurants or on vacations. So I looked at that 2% GDP gap, I looked at the 14% of fiscal stimulus, and I judged that it was overwhelmingly likely that the bathtub would overflow. And that's what in fact took place. We had uh, nominal GDP growth, uh, total spending increased by 11.5%. Well, there was no way that an economy 2% short, two short of potential was going to have an 11% uh, GDP growth rate in terms of its real output. So the consequence was inevitably going to be uh, inflation. And 
that's what turned out uh, to be the case. I think that inflation has had uh, unfortunate consequences for uh, many uh, working people. I think it's had unfortunate consequences for confidence in uh, government. I don't think it's what we wanted in uh, this uh, economic environment. I also think that the decision in that package uh, to concentrate as heavily as was done on transfer payments had the effect of leading us to spend very substantially, use up fiscal capacity, and therefore reduce the investments in the future of our country that might otherwise have been made. Fortunately, and it was an extraordinary accomplishment of uh, President uh, Biden's, we have had a very important and successful legislation bearing on infrastructure in our country, bearing on uh, developing our capacities in science and technology, bearing on uh, our investments in uh, green uh, technologies. So I think this is gonna be remembered as a successful period. And I think it's also important to point out that while I was on this occasion correct in my economic forecasts, um, I was, mine was very much a minority voice among economists when I forecast inflation. And so the policies the administration was following, I mean, many have tried to label them as politically irresponsible. And, you know, I didn't, I recommended against them, but I, it's very important to say that most respected economists felt that that kind of stimulus was appropriate. And so this was a case where a lot of the blame has to rest with uh, consensus economic analysis that I think perhaps let what it hoped for get the better of what it should have analyzed and seen. Right, interesting. Um, so why do you think, well, you've given us part of the answer, but why do you think no one wanted to really listen to you at the time? Was it, well, the economic consensus, as you said, it was, was it wishful thinking about the economy? And to what extent have notions like, you know, MMT, modern sort of magical thinking about the economy and the, the relations, you know, the importance of debt, how much has this influenced thinking about American economic policy in your view? I think the most important thing was the shortness of memory. Uh, it had been 40 years since we had had inflation. People weren't used to dealing with uh, inflation. Most observers didn't remember uh, inflation. And any statistical model fit to 40 years of data when the inflation rate was more or less constant would almost in inevitably conclude that uh, inflation would not um, be a source of uh, substantial, uh, but would not, would not come back almost no matter what you did. So I think that was probably the first factor. I think there's also a, a natural kind of political dynamic where people want to make new mistakes. And the mistakes made after 2008 had been of insufficient stimulus. There was a real concern about, and a valid concern, about populism and inequality in the country. And people wanted to act very strongly with respect to uh, that concern. And so I think that was an additional uh, important factor. Hmm. And modern monetary theory, is that having in much think, influence? You know, in your view? Um, you know, someone once said to me that uh, politicians use economic theories the way drunks use lampposts for support rather than for illumination. 
<laughs> and I think you had politicians who wanted to spend and wanted to be told that they could ignore budget constraints and ignore certain arithmetic realities mm -hmm. and modern so-called modern monetary uh, theory provided them with an intellectual rationalization. And so I think it's better that better to see it that way than to see it as a important intellectual force that mm -hmm. moved uh, the debate. Um, its proponents, I have to say, in addition to, I think, being fairly wildly wrong as experience has demonstrated, were not people who either in the past or in the subsequent period have been uh, influ have been influential um, at all. And so I think this was a case where it was uh, a demand for rationalization that produced a supply in terms of economic theory rather than evidence of intellectual influence. Hmm. Let me turn to unemployment, which I know you've thought a lot about this and have been concerned about this for a long time. So it is one of the great social evils and challenges for a society. There are many people in this country, far, far too many. There are many people who think that if we, if we allow a little more inflation, we could have an impact on employment and we could lower unemployment. And that's the most important criteria. So why is inflation so dangerous and harmful for a society in your view, for employment and especially for poorer people? And I think it's very important to understand what is the modern understanding of the relationship between inflation and unemployment. Okay. It's it's like um, the relationship um, between certain drugs and feeling better. It's not enough to just take a dose and feel better. At a certain point, you become habituated to the dose and you have to take an ever larger dose if you want to continue to get a buzz. And the same thing is true with respect to inflation. Mm. It's only inflation that accelerates and surprises that is associated with stimulus to the economy and associated with the reduction in unemployment. And so if the goal is to achieve lower unemployment permanently, the necessary path involves not higher, higher inflation, but constantly accelerating inflation, which at some point causes the economy uh, to break down. And so the idea that there is some exploitable trade-off where you can accept more inflation and then have lower unemployment fundamentally misunderstands how economies operate. That was the central intellectual lesson of the 1970s. In the 1970s, we caused ourselves to have, in almost every major country, the phenomenon of stagflation. We had high inflation, but we also had high unemployment, something that would not have been predicted by the previous uh, theories. And so the reason why mainstream economists like myself believe very strongly in um, disciplined monetary policies is not because we think inflation is more important than unemployment. It is not because we think some kind of financial virtue is a worthy objective for its own sake. It is not because we are other than totally concerned about the loss of output and even more, the loss of human fulfillment that comes from unemployment. Rather, we make a judgment about what will minimize that over time. 
And the reading of experience is that when you make the kinds of mistakes that were made in the 1970s, when you make the kinds of mistakes that have been made many times in emerging markets and allow inflation to accelerate, the cure causes far more unemployment than any reduction in unemployment that was achieved with uh, the inflation. And so my advocacy of a focus on containing inflation is based on a desire to maximize the average level of employment uh, through time and a firm awareness that the moments when we have had the most aggressive monetary policies have been the moments when over time, we had the highest average uh, unemployment uh, rate. I think this is a very important uh, thing uh, to uh, recognize. You know, it's a little bit like um, at this moment, uh, I think of an experience that I suspect many on this call have had, certainly I have had, the doctor prescribed me antibiotics. The doctor told me to take the whole course of uh, antibiotics. I took the first three days and then I felt better. And I didn't like taking antibiotics and you know, I just didn't like the feeling of it. And so I stopped taking the antibiotics. And then my problem came back and it was more difficult to solve the second time because it had become resistant. Well, in just the same way, an insufficient effort to contain inflation risks a relapse of inflation with much greater costs to bring that uh, inflation uh, down. I think it's also important to emphasize uh, and that people like you and me, I suspect people like many on this call are able to insulate themselves from inflation. We don't hold large amounts of money in currency or in zero interest uh, checking, um, uh, checking accounts, uh, for uh, example. We are able to arrange our affairs so as to take advantage of buying early things whose prices are uh, going to go up. But experience suggests that those less fortunate are often the biggest losers uh, from uh, inflation. And that, too, is a reason why it's important to contain inflation. Hmm. Well, thank you. That's music to our governor of the Reserve Bank's ears, but there are a lot of critics of that position. So thank you for that very clear exposition. Now. You've been skeptical about the prospects of the US avoiding a recession as it reduces inflation. Why is it not possible to let the air out of the balloon more gently, in your view? I, I, start, I start, as I think economists always should, by looking at history. And what history teaches is that as Samuel Johnson uh, said of second marriage, soft landings represent the triumph of hope over experience. And we just don't have examples. Every time inflation gets up and unemployment gets down, inflation mm -hmm. above four, unemployment below four, the economy goes into recession within two years. And it's not obvious why one should think that things would be uh, substantially uh, different uh, this, uh, this time. You know, letting the air out of a balloon gently is um, maybe possible sometimes, but there's a separate empirical fact about the American economy, and I think there are some similar facts about other economies known as uh, Somm's rule. Uh, Somm's rule 
is the proposition that whenever unemployment goes up by half a percent, it also goes up by 2%. Um, if that's true, then it suggests that it's likely to be very difficult to do all of this in a controlled uh, way. It certainly is what one would uh, prefer uh, to have happen. It's just not been the experience of past disinflations that it's worked out uh, yeah. that way. Yeah. So if there is a hard landing in America, what will this mean for developing countries in your view? Can we do anything about this? Let me first say that there are three major poles of the global economy, the United States, the European Union, and China. And that while I'm hardly very optimistic about the United States, I'm probably more optimistic about the United States than I am about Europe or I am about China. Europe has somewhat similar issues of inflation, but also is suffering a major supply shock from what's happening in global energy markets, and in particular, the cutoff of Russian natural gas with the associated uh, very substantial increase in uh, energy, uh, in uh, electricity uh, prices. And so, I think Europe is almost certain to go into in, into recession and potentially quite deep recession in the next uh, 12 months. I think China is facing all kinds of challenges, uh, COVID and financial strains and now political instability in the very short run. The question of what the growth engine will be the legacy of state uh, control and a shrinking population in the medium uh, to uh, longer term. And so I think the next year is likely to be a difficult year for uh, the global economy and is likely to be challenging uh, for, many emerge, uh, for many emerging markets. Mm. Mm. So these issues of what, what happens in emerging markets as a consequence of American economic policy, should this feature more in debates in the United States or is it thought about sufficiently in your view? You know, I think <laughs> that um, probably it's appropriate that the United States primarily make its monetary and fiscal policies based on the interests of our own economic strength. And by the way, the world has an enormous stake in our economic strength, given the way in which we are a market for uh, imports, uh, a source of export of ideas and uh, entrepreneurship. I do wish that America would support a more outward looking international economic policy in which we were doing more to finance green transitions around the world, in which we were doing more to support the substantial expansion of the international financial institutions. Hmm. Let me turn to an issue that I know you've written about and is relevant for South Africa, which is competition policy. You've been critical of what you have called hipster antitrust policies. You've argued that it's very important to distinguish between protecting competition and protecting competitors. Can you explain what you mean by this and why you think it's so important? Imagine a very successful firm, like for example, Walmart in uh, the United States, that 
is able to produce very efficiently to provide a very large variety of services and as a consequence is able to provide goods at lower costs to consumers than smaller corner grocery stores. Not because it has some moral superiority to those small corner grocery stores, but simply because of the technological capacities that it has. Should we reject Walmart and not allow Walmart to expand and provide those services and those goods at low cost to consumers in order to protect the corner grocery stores? Or should our criterion be what will be best for consumers? Recognizing that if Walmart at some point becomes a monopoly and exploits that monopoly to raise prices, that's something that certainly should attract the attention of authorities. But my argument is that the touchstone should be a thoughtful and careful evaluation of what is in consumers' interests. And often, what will be most upsetting to rivals in an industry is a new firm that does things in a new way that is more efficient, or an old firm that transforms itself into a way that makes it a more formidable competitor. That seems to me to be competition. And so I'm all for vigorous competition that seeks to win by making consumers the winner. But when the argument is not about protecting the idea of competition with a winner that ultimately benefits consumers, but is instead an idea about protecting existing competitors, that's where I become uh, much more uh, skeptical. And I have been um, quite troubled by uh, some of the statements that have been made um, by uh, US antitrust uh, authorities suggesting that size is per se to be regarded as a major uh, problem and suggesting uh, that we should overturn um, what had been a 40 year bipartisan tradition of emphasizing the importance of making goods available at the lowest possible cost and with the greatest possible um, innovation uh, for, uh, cons for uh, consumers. I think, it's, I think this is an area where it is very easy to be simplistic and it can be uh, very costly. You know, many people tend to feel that when a larger company buys a small company in a related area, that something bad has happened because the small company has been eliminated as a competitor. And sometimes that will be right. But at other times, the small company will be able to lever its technology much more rapidly and much more effectively for the benefit of consumers. And it's also important to remember that the vast majority of small companies in the economy don't ever go on to the public markets. They are acquired by larger companies. And if you remove the possibility of acquisition, you will also reduce the incentive to start small companies. And that will in turn also affect the dynamism of uh, an economy. So I'm very much a believer in vigorous antitrust policy. And I think that the United States over the last 40 years has probably had more errors of insufficiently vigorous antitrust policy 
than it has of overly vigorous antitrust policy. But I really do believe that uh, there is a imp crucial importance to doing this in an economically grounded uh, way. Mm. Let's, let's dig deeper in this a bit and talk about big tech. So a lot of people say, you know, they're the, all these big companies and this is bad for everybody and we must break them up and we must do something about this. Um, Tyler Cowen has argued a, against a lot of the popular arguments in this area. But what is your view? You know, the EU is trying to legislate this. How do you see the debate about big tech and competition and all the things you're talking about, buying up smaller companies and so on? You know, I think in every, in almost every area, it's a mistake uh, to dichotomize and say all big tech is good or all breakups are good. And I think you really have to judge uh, the merits of individual uh, cases. Hmm. Um, I am not sure what exactly the theory of harm is in some of these cases. After all, um, it's not that consumers pay anything to use Facebook or pay anything to use uh, Google or that the prices one gets on Amazon are lower, are higher than the prices that are otherwise uh, available. There are a range of um, uh, social media platforms, Snapchat, TikTok, that uh, compete. And so I think we need to be careful of the argument uh, that simply because they're large, they should be uh, broken up. On the other hand, I think there are obvious concerns with untruthful statements, damaging uh, statements, invasions of uh, privacy. And it's hard to believe that these kinds of new technology should not be, should not be regulated. And I think we need to have very thoughtful debates about how that regulation uh, should uh, and can uh, best uh, take uh, best take place. But when I see, for example, the head of the FTC seeming to suggest, um, and I may not be getting it right in its nuance, that. Um, Amazon shouldn't be permitted to have Amazon brand products because that's somehow unfair. I wonder why it is that when I go to the supermarket, the supermarket is allowed to have supermarket brand uh, products. And so I think we need to just uh, be careful here as to how we... Um, how we proceed um, on uh, on these matters. Hmm. Hmm. Very uh, interesting. Let, let me move to a more general question about business and government. So you've talked about the importance of cooperation between both the private sector and government in the solution of problems in the United States rather than what you call the vilification of profiteers. So my first question is, let's start here. There are a lot of people in the US and elsewhere, including South Africa, who are critical about companies that make profits at times of great disruption in the economy. So as we're seeing now because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine or COVID, um, they see large companies as greedy and uncaring and exploitative to, in these kinds of situations. How do you think about this? Again, I don't, I find it hard to 
get myself to uh, dichotomize, dichotomize, uh, uh, dichotomize completely. I, I certainly think that um, businesses are owned by their shareholders. Their shareholders are people of moral interest. And I think the companies should reflect the moral interests of their shareholders. And I think most shareholders are have uh, moral uh, cons have moral uh, concerns. I I think one has to be very careful. Take the case that you sort of mentioned. Um, the price of oil goes up, and um, the uh, and uh, companies earn profits when there's a shortage of oil. I guess I'm reminded of an experience I had many, many years ago. I um, visited a resort town in America and I had failed to make a hotel reservation. And it was a beautiful day and it was a holiday weekend. And we drove around to 20 hotels. And at the 20th, which was not a very nice hotel, we um, pay, we got a room and the price of the room was extremely high. It was much higher than seemed reasonable for a hotel like that. And my companion was quite annoyed. And I said, this is an example of the market working. That hotel, could have rented that room much earlier, but it chose to hold that room off the market, recognizing that it might be a beautiful day with big crowds, or it might be a ugly day and it would never rent that room. And because it did that, we didn't have to turn around and drive three hours back to San Francisco. And so the incentive of that hotel to possibly get a super high priced customer led there to be a hotel room there when we most needed it. I think as a society, we want to encourage people to have excess capacity that will be available when there is a crisis. And if we say that when there is a crisis, you can't make a profit, and most of the time there will not be a crisis, there will be no incentive to provide that supply. So I'm not saying that every price that everyone wants to charge in every situation should, uh, should go. But I think we do have to think carefully about incentives. And I am struck, uh, particularly, I have to say, among some of my progressive friends, by on the one hand, they put a tremendous emphasis on the importance of resilience. On the other hand, they're most enthusiastic to punish those who've been most constructive in providing for resilience by saying that whenever there's any kind of emergency or something becomes in very short supply, the people who have it aren't allowed to sell it at a market price. And I think reflection on resilience has to recognize um, both of uh, these uh, aspects. Do you agree? Larry with Martin Wolf, who, who says that American com big companies in America have now got much too much influence in the politics of America. That in a sense, for people who believe in competition, the large companies play too big a role in writing the rules of the game. You've been in government. How do you see this? Do you agree with that perspective? You know, Wall Street to, to White House and back and all of that. Well, 
look, I think there are excesses. Um, when I was in government and uh, Dodd-Frank legislation was being uh, worked out, that was legislation uh, directed at financial regulation. And there were five registered lobbyists for every single member of Congress and Senate working on that on behalf of the financial uh, industry. Hmm. So I think there are excesses of uh, large uh, corporate uh, excesses of lobbying by uh, large uh, corporations. But I think in many cases, and I think that is something that we should um, try in various ways to, ref to reform. But if I think about the biggest excesses, the biggest special interest excesses in the United States, they often actually don't involve very large uh, corporations. They involve, for example, uh, rules that make it very hard. You would think that as house prices rise, it doesn't, it's not harder to sell a house than it was 10 years ago when houses cost half as much as they do now. It's really not. So you might have thought that the percentage that a realtor got would go down. But it hasn't <laughs> happened. And the reason is that the realtors are able to collude. And that's basically because of a variety of laws because there are a lot of realtors in every congressional district. There are a variety in most countries of really quite extraordinary subsidies to farmers that, you know, you could pay for every cow to go around the earth several times for what the European Union uh, spends. That's not a that's a very egregious distortion in the market, but that's not caused uh, by a uh, big uh, corp a big corporation. In the United States, for it's not really that complicated for most families to write wills. She says that all her money goes to him. He says that all her money goes. To her, the two of them say that if something happens to both of them, all the money goes to their kids. It's really not that hard. But it costs a small fortune to write a will because the lawyers as a profession have limited who it is who's allowed to sign uh, those, uh, regula those regulations. I could keep going with a large number of examples where we're not getting very efficient economic outcomes. Mm. And in many, many cases, it wouldn't be large corporations that were causing it. It would be large coalitions that precisely because unlike large corporations, they're located in every one of the 435 congressional districts, has realtors, has uh, lawyers. Almost all of them have, uh, have uh, farmers. So when I think about uh, money and politics, I, there, there certainly are some issues that should be addressed involving uh, large corporations. But I don't think those are the biggest distortions that are hurting uh, regular middle class people. The diversity of vested interests that are yes, I mean, a, I don't know yeah. if I don't know if it has I don't know if it's widely read in uh, South Africa, but there was an economist Mansur Olson who wrote. Yes a very, very important book, uh, a couple of books. One was called The Logic of Collective Action, and the sec subsequent one was called The Rise and Decline of Nations. And it makes exactly this kind of point about mm -hmm. how and in what circumstances 
interest groups are likely to form and to set things up. Hmm. I want to come back to China. Um, you have publicly started questioning the assumption that China will inevitably eventually eclipse the US economy in size. So, so you, you gave us a hint of your views of China, but how do you see this? Why do you, why are you, are you a minority on this issue as well at the moment? I uh, know there are a few people starting to, to question what's happening in China and its, its future, but how do you see this? Why are you taking this view about size? Start with this. Would you want to bet on a country where capital and people are trying desperately to get in, or a country where capital and people are trying very hard to get out? Hmm. The United States is the former kind of country. China is the latter kind of country. And in my experience, um, and this would be true in your country, frankly, um, one of the best ways to judge when an emerging market may well have difficulty ahead is when its wealthiest citizens are seeking to move their capital out of the country. Mm. And that's certainly been the case in China for the last uh, several uh, years. China now has a substantially lower birth rate than it did when there was a law that said that women could only have one children, one child. Mm. Um, at current forecasts, China's population will be substantially lower at the end of the 21st century uh, than it was 22nd century, or 20th, 21st century, than it was at the end of the 20th, uh, uh, at the end of uh, the 20th century. China has to ask itself the question, what is the growth engine from here? For many years, the growth engine was exports, but the world is losing its tolerance for Chinese exports and Chinese labor costs are rising pretty fast. Mm. For many years, it was infrastructure, but China laid more concrete in five years in the teens than the United States did during the 21st century, during the whole of the 20th century. Then for many years, it was housing, but China's housing stock now includes enough empty units to house the entire population of Germany. And so the question is, where is it gonna go? And one natural answer is that China has traditionally had a very low share of consumer spending in GDP. And so they need to empower consumers. But that's gonna mean transferring a lot of resources from the 100 million members of the Communist Party to the 1.3 billion non-members of the Communist Party. And it remains to be seen whether that's something that Xi Jinping is going to do. So I think that the next years in China are not likely to uh, be uh, easy uh, ones, though certainly people have counted out China before and been badly wrong. But I am reminded of the late 1950s when American high school students rushed to study Russian and the late 1980s when American high school students rushed to study Japan. And when I see a rush to study Mandarin, I'm not altogether sure how that is going to um, work out. <laughs> Well, we'll see. That's really interesting. Um, let me come on to COVID and the, dis the disruptions of COVID, supply chain disruptions, economic disruptions, and the lockdowns, how countries responded. How serious is all of this for the global economy, do you think? And then now with the Russian invasion and the war in Ukraine and the sanctions, how serious are these 
big events in your view for how we should think about the future of the global economy? How worried are you? Look, I think that, I think on the one hand, the fact that the world is much smaller and more networked permits much greater exploitation of the division of labor. It yeah. permits those who are ahead to lift up those who are behind in much better ways. But it also means more fragility. And it also exposes us to more risk. My best guess is that the half-life return time for major pandemic is not 100 years. It's more like 15 years. And I'm not altogether sure that we're going to be more ready next time than we were this time. And so I think that needs to be a crucial uh, global uh, global uh, priority. I think there's a substantial chance that climate, if not well addressed, could do very significant uh, damage uh, to uh, the global economy. And so I think there does need to be a major stepping up there. I do think we've been enormously fortunate in what has happened with technology but we still do have a long way to go. So building on that, you've said that this is a moment that calls for boldness and imagination on the part of the United States and international leaders. What could this involve? And are you starting to see this? How optimistic are you? You know, um... I am struck that nine months ago, there was a sense that democracy was failing and that autocracy was on the rise. But today, the governments of Iran, of Russia, and China are all looking unsuccessful and even a bit uh, fragile. Mm. In contrast, while everyone was so alarmed after January 6th about elections in democratic countries, all the losers called all the winners after the last American election and conceded. The most reactionary and revanchist elements, many of the protégés of Donald Trump, were very soundly defeated. In Brazil, the Latin American uh, Trump was defeated, and the transition appears to be uh, quite uh, smooth. I look at where people want to come, where capital wants uh, to uh, come, and I've got a fair amount of optimism for <laughs> the ways in which uh, things can run. Winston Churchill never actually said it, but the line is attributed to him that uh, the United States always, always does the right thing, but only after exhausting the alternatives. And I think that captures a truth about the United States. Um, I'm old enough to remember when people thought the Cold War was over and Japan had won, when people thought that we had a crisis of the national spirit when Jimmy Carter gave his malaise uh, speech, when there was a sense that the whole country was falling apart during the Vietnam War and uh, riots on college campuses and the fact that the president of the United States could only speak on uh, 
military uh, bases. I've read history to know that the prospects for union were very much in doubt at the time of the Civil War. Mm. But Patrick Henry declared that uh, the uh, spirit of the revolution had already been lost in 1792. And I think it's the great strength of democracy in general and America in particular that it has a resilience because of a capacity for self-denying prophecy. And it is precisely the capacity to become so very alarmed to issue and write these Jeremiads that is part of a process that sets in motion restorative forces. And I think that's what we're gonna to start to see um, going forward. And I look at the extraordinary things that technology is making uh, possible and I'm optimistic about the future. Take a small thing that I read about yesterday and it's not that big a thing, but it's the kind of thing we take for granted. The number of hours of work that it takes a typical American worker to purchase an air conditioner that will air condition a room in her house has fallen by 97% since I was born. That's just an immense difference in the way people are able to live. And yes, real wages are stagnant and there's a struggling middle class, but 97% in the span of a single human lifetime, that is really a lot. So I, I think we will struggle, we will have problems, there will be problematic uh, governance, but uh, Ultimately, um, I am a believer uh, in uh, progress. Well, that's great. Um, I'm with you. So on that note, I'm going to end our conversation. Larry Summers, this has been a fantastic con discussion. Uh, I've learned a great deal and I'm sure the audience has as well. And as Democrats in different parts of the world, I certainly hope you're right and that all of us who believe in progress and democracy can, can help make things turn in a better direction, both globally and in your country and in mine. So thank you very much for being with us. Really appreciate it. And thanks for being with us, everybody on this call. Um, this is our last one for the year, and we couldn't have asked for a better speaker. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Anne. Bye-bye. Great. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. This, this, is, this conversation is over, unfortunately. <laughs>